What's up team? Kestiva back here with another lesson. So and today we're going to be designing shear walls. Um, and more importantly, the first thing we do when we start designing our shear walls is we check global stability. And there's a couple of different checks that you need to go through in order to assure that your shear wall is globally stable. We're going to walk through those with a nice little example for you. So I've already sketched it up. Uh, as you can see, I've gone with an example of a, a wood shear wall, and that wood shear wall is mounted or, or is built on top of a concrete strip footing. So the wood shear wall is denoted by the blue, as shown, and then the concrete footing is denoted in red below. The wood shear wall is 10 feet high, and the strip footing is one foot thick. And I've made a cross section AA, and denoted it below here. So you have a typical cross section through that strip footing. And the strip footing is two feet uh, wide and one foot thick, as I've said. And I've applied a five kip lateral load to the shear wall. Now today we're not diving into how you get that lateral load and how it distributes to this particular shear wall. I will be making future examples of that and kind of the the ultimate thing in the pipeline that I want to do and is actually suggested to me is make a series of videos that goes through soup to nuts the entire design uh, of a structure. So I think that might be pretty cool over the course of time here. So I will be working on that, but this is kind of a taste of that world. So again, I'm not going into you know flexible and rigid um, shear wall systems and diaphragms uh, and how the lateral loads, whether seismic or uh, wind-induced, distribute to the shear wall. I'm We're already past that point, and we're saying just five kips is your lateral load that's applying to this particular shear wall. Oops, something I haven't done is this shear wall. Let's see where I want to just put it here. This shear wall is 30 feet long. You have a uh, dead load from the roof, as shown above, 175 pounds per lineal foot along the top of this shear wall, or supporting, the shear wall supporting that load. You have the self-weight of the shear wall itself, which I've denoted as 75 pounds per lineal foot. And then you have the self-weight of the footing, it's concrete footing itself, which is 300 pounds per lineal foot. And, the, you know, I, I could go into a breakdown of how generally I got those forces and where my assumptions came from, but... We're just going to roll with those loads for the example today. So bear with me. I can go into breaking that down later, but got a lot to go through. All right, so global stability. We have three checks that we do as professional engineers. We have overturning forces, so making sure that that lateral force up top here does not overturn and basically, in a very radical case, lift up your entire shear wall and topple it over. So that's overturning that we're checking for. The second one is sliding. So you want to make sure that that, again, that lateral load of five kips is not sliding, is picking up the entire wall and pushing it, nope, picking up that entire wall and just pushing it and sliding it out of place. And lastly, we check for um, bearing conditions. So we check that our maximum bearing pressure does not exceed our allowable bearing pressure. And that's when you have um, massive or, or very large eccentricities, or even if you just have large um, non-eccentric loading, concentric loading, and your footings might be undersized. So you always want to make sure that uh, you check these three things to ensure that you're globally stable. Let's jump in. All right, number one. Overturning moment, as I'll denote herein, is OTM. Now, for each of these, when you're checking global stability, something very important, it can be done multiple ways, but this might seem confusing if, if you're not told this, is that when checking global stability, we are going to be using service level forces. So, and again, what that means is there's no load combinations applied to any of this. It's just straight up the loads that everything is um, so five kips I've said it above that it's uh, it's induced by wind but that's really I just wanted to throw that in there um, 
but that does not mean we go into our load combinations and we choose the one that has wind in it and then we apply factors based on LRFD or ASD. We do none of that in the global stability. We apply those load combinations and those factors when we actually design our shear walls so or our hold downs, our straps, our sheathing type, our nailing patterns, reinforcing the concrete, all of that stuff all the way through. Um, we, we apply obviously those load combinations, but for just for global stability, we do not. It's simply the forces at hand with no factors applied. And what we do is we then take those results and we compare them to a factor of safety. And it's usually an industry standard where I'll start it off here, where a factor of safety for overturning, you want to make sure you're under or you're greater than a factor of safety of 2.0. For sliding, you're greater than a factor of safety of 1.5. And for bearing, you're greater than a factor of safety of 2.0. And you'll see what those equate, what the factor safeties equate to and how we find them as I move along here. Okay, whew, that out of the way. Number one, overturning moment. So we have, what moment do we have? The well, moment is force times a perpendicular distance. So we have our force of five kips and we have our perpendicular distance. Perpendicular distance to what though? Where's our point that we're checking about? Well, the point that we're checking about you know what, I'll do a different color, green. The point that we're checking about is right here. So we'll call that mm, Q, just for fun. So we're checking, overturning about that point. And so we have our five kips for our force, and then our perpendicular distance to Q is 10 feet plus one feet, so 11 feet. So therefore, our overturning moment is equal to five kips times 11 feet, which equals 55 kip feet. Now, we need our resisting moment. So in this case, we have all these dead loads and self-weight of the wall itself and the footing itself that is resisting that overturning effect from that lateral load. And so what those are, we can call M resist that's equal to all of these weights, I'll use green again, all of these weights added together, because what you're getting is if you have point Q, you now have, so we had, when you break it down and just see the statics of it, you had your lateral of five kips times your 11 feet, now you have, in essence, a distributed load across the entire footing, or length of shear wall, which is 30 feet long. And we just need that distributed load, we'll call it, denote it W. So that gives you a moment that is counterclockwise, that counteracts, or excuse me, that's clockwise, that counteracts the lateral forces, which create a moment that is counterclockwise. So that's your, that's what's happening here. So this is resisting moment, and this is overturning moment effects. Okay, so we need W. So W is the summation of the forces above. So like I said, so we have 175 PLF, we have 75 PLF, and we have 300 PLF. So let's add all those together. 175 PLF, 75 PLF, 300 PLF, times 30 feet. Okay, so this, and we're gonna, yeah, we're just gonna keep it like that. So right now it's, that's uh, pounds. So that's your force, that's your total force. And for a distributed load, we know that the equation is gonna be W times L squared over two. This right here is W, 30 feet is your L. So we're gonna square that now. We're gonna divide it by two and we're gonna divide the whole thing by a thousand to get it into kip feet, which gets you 200, uh, whoop. Let's get you 248 kip feet. All right, now we need to check our factor of safety. Well, factor of safety 
is equal to, in this case, capacity over demand. Now our capacity is our resisting moment, so 248 over demand, um, which is 55. That gets us 4.5. And like I said, up above, the factors of safety in general practice, you want to make sure you're greater than, greater than 2.0 factor safety. Well, we're at 4.5, which is greater than 2.0, so we're okay. All right, so that's good. So in this case, because it's a 30 foot long wall and five kips is not, well, it's not nothing for a lateral load, but it's not a very significant, it's not an incredibly large lateral load. So in order to, if you think about it, overturn a wall that's 30 feet long, that's only 10 feet high, that uh, the, the ratios of the wall geometry are really helping you out. So it makes sense that the overturning forces are not an issue for this case. Now, if you had more of a wall that was much taller and much shorter, and you had that going on, that would cause significantly higher overturning uh, moments rather than what we have is more like, more like that. So it changes with the, the patterns of ge your geometry. So if you get some funkier buildings, you know, don't just always assume that this is a overturning moment for your shear walls is not a big deal. Every time it's custom, so you always gotta check. All right, rocking and rolling. Number two, sliding. Now, for sliding, we did not introduce something yet that we need to. So you need to know your friction factor, your coefficient of uh, friction between your footing and your soil. Because what's happening is that you have your footing and you have your wall above. And if you have that lateral load breaking down the statics into your, um, into your X forces, you have the five kip force acting from the right to the left, which means it needs to be counteracted from the left to the right. Well, the way it's counteracted in the X plane is actually through friction between the soil and the foundation. And how that works is you have a friction factor, and that is typically given when you're doing a, uh, a design, a geotechnical report is done by you guessed it, geotechnical engineers, and they provide what that friction factor is to the structural engineer to use in our calculations. Um, so in this case, we're gonna say, I think that's mu. Correct me if I'm wrong on the, on the Greek, sorry about that. Uh, mu FS, uh, factor of sliding or friction sliding, uh, is gonna be equal to 0 0.5, and that's, that's pretty standard. I mean, it, sometimes if you're not sure at all, if you don't have a geotechnical report, if it's like a residential project or it's really small, you can be conservative and you could say like 0 0.3 at your, at your least. That's pretty generous, but even 0 0.5 is, is decently generous. But today we're gonna rock and roll with just 0 0.3. And we're back. Just had to plug in my computer. All right. And how you calculate friction factor or the force that resists um, sliding is simply your friction factor. So we'll call that your resistance is equal to your friction factor times the weight, we'll call it big W, of your shear wall. And that's it. So resistance is gonna equal 0 0.5. Now the weight above, we can denote as W, um, which we saw up top here. We already solved for that. So W is gonna equal 550 PLF times 30 feet. And we're gonna divide all of that by 1,000 to get it into kips. And that's gonna equal 8.25 kips. And now our force to resist, our lateral force, we know is just equal to five kips. So our factor of safety is equal to capacity over demand, as we said, which is capacity is 8.25 kips 
divided by demand, which is 5 kips, which gets us 1.65 factor safety, which is greater than. Now, for this case, for sliding, it's pretty industry standard. Again, correct me if I'm wrong, but typically we use 1.5 as a factor of safety for this. So as long as you're greater than 1.5, you're good to go. So we are, we are okay. So see, that one, we're, we're decently close to that 1.5 factor safety. So um, everything has its different effects. So in this case, in order to increase your resistance to sliding, you either need to increase the weight of your structure or you need to lengthen your shear wall. Um, there's a couple, those are basically the two things that you can do. You can sharpen the pencil a little bit to make sure that the weights that are being supported by your shear wall, maybe they're a little bit higher, maybe you get a little extra there. So a couple things you can do. And actually, this doesn't even take into account passive effects of um, usually these shear walls will terminate up above here into like a perpendicular, like exterior wall, the, you know, the exterior stem wall of your building. And what that does is, so say that's your exterior of your building, you know, there's a tree outside here. This is your finished grade. And what you then also get to do is you get to take into passive effects of some portion of your exterior st perpendicular stem wall. So there are a couple of things if you start to get uh, pinched on this, but that's what we like to call sharpening the pencil if we need to. But we don't right now. We're good. Everything is resisted just by that, uh, by the friction between the footing and the soil itself. Moving on. And just one more to go. We have number three, bearing. Now, for bearing, you need, like I said before, an allowable bearing pressure. That I have not given yet. Again, that is usually given by the geotechnical engineer. Um, they usually conduct a report, and that is one of the things, that's like one of the main things that's in there. So if it's not in there and you paid for a report, eh, you should probably talk to them because you're supposed to have that. So... Uh, allowable bearing pressure equal, we'll call it in this case, 3,000 PSF. That's that's also pretty standard. Um, there's plenty of cases where you can get higher than that. There's also some crappy cases where you can be lower than that. So 3,000 PSF for this case. And what's happening in this check, for everyone who doesn't know, again, you have your footing, you have your lateral force, and what that's doing is giving you some type of non-concentric bearing uh, on the soil below. So you're getting higher stress bearing stress concentrations towards the other end, the second half of your, of your strip footing. And you need to make sure that that highest point, that largest bearing pressure is not exceeding, we'll call that phi or phi u, I think that's phi. That's not V. Oh, man, the Greek symbols are so bad today with me. Well, you need to make sure that your ultimate stress, and I'm using ultimate in this case, not in terms of LRFD, just roll with me on this. So your ultimate stress cannot be, needs to be less than your allowable. So that's what we're checking. How do we do that? Well, first we need to find P. P we are denoting as just the entire self the entire weight of your shear wall so for that again we solved it above we know that it's 550 plf and it's a 30 foot long shear wall well that equals 16.5 kips you need your moment our moment was solved above which was 55 kip feet and now you need to check your eccentricity. So eccentricity is equal to M over P. 55 over 16.5 is equal to 3.33 feet. Well, and you're like, well, what am I comparing that to? Well, what you're comparing it to is you're making sure that it falls within the Kern limit of the footing geometry. And what happens if you need to make sure that your loads applied within the kern 
um, and that way this will cause compression over the entire area of the footing. If your sum of forces falls outside of the kern, then that means that you are getting um, uplift in your footing, which means that the part of your footing is actually theoretically lifting up off of the soil and that's that's no boy now that's not good we don't we don't want that as engineers at all that give you a, give you a lot of heartburn if you had to professionally stamp something and you had something like that going on so that's what the current limit is there for and what the current limit is is um this is broken down through testing but um is through a factor of just l over six l in our case is the 30 feet so l over six is equal to five feet so we know that e is less than l over six okay and what that tells us is the following so i just i'm going to give you these quick little diagrams to tell you what's going on uh, uh visually instead of how i just uh explained it before so if you have zero eccentricity so equals zero which means you have no moment acting on your your shear wall it's just all gravity loads that means that your footing is just experiencing concentric loading. So it's just a perfectly evenly distributed force uh, bearing pressure acting on your soil. Perfect, good. If there is some amount of moment, but not that much moment, so if there is eccentricity but that is greater than zero, so it means there is some, and is less than or equal to L over 6, which is that current limit, you get the following on your footing. Now, I'm not drawing these to scale. Well, you know what? Not to confuse anyone, let's, let's do it like this. I'll try to draw these to scale. Doing such a poor job. There we go. You start to get an, uh, an eccentric distribution of bearing pressure on the soil, which means that you start to get a higher concentration at one end than at the other. And what this ultimately breaks down into is eventually, the closer you get to the kern of L over six, say your E equals L over six, you get all the way to that point, that gets you that type of loading. So your maximum bearing pressure increases even more at the one end, but then at the close end, your bearing pressure goes all the way to zero at that corner of the footing. So technically, it doesn't experience uplift. There's still um, compressive stress throughout the footing, but at that very end, it's zero. You're at the limit. And then you have when E is greater than L over 6, you're outside of the kern. And that looks like this. So it really starts to jack up this is this is no good we'd never never like to design for this again chime in if you have other opinions but we try to stay out of this zone um at all usually at all cost or we try to prove through sharpening of the pencil that that this limit state doesn't happen um but what you have now is your your maximum so your ultimate or your you know your maximum bearing pressure at that far end and again sorry this is assuming you have some type of lateral and moment this one there's no no moment right here but overturning about about that portion from from left to right or from right to left forces and what happens is you have some portion of your footing that is experiencing uplift so there, there's no compressive um, uh, pressures acting on that portion of the footing which is rendering it kind of useless and you get into all kinds of sticky situations so stay out of that so uh, tangent there sorry we have proven back up here that our eccentricity is less than l over six so we are in this case and what that means is you have q min and q max now q min equals the following q max similarly equals the following whoops quick mistake q min equals that q max equals this 
Okay, so we have our two equations, but you're like, hey, wait a second. What is going on with B? What is B precisely? Well, if we scroll back to the top, no need to fear. B is just the width of your footing. So in this case, as I circle it here, that is B. All right, so two feet. Again, not the length of your footing, but the width of your footing. L is the length of our footing. So we know now, whoop, we know that B equals two feet. All right, so that means we have everything. So let's go and plug in. Q min equals 92 PSF. Now notice what I did here. I converted into pounds out of kips and then kept everything else in feet. So that gives you PSF, so pressure of PSF, pounds per square foot. So 92 PSF, so that's pretty low. That's almost close to zero. So you can see that we were, if you look up here, 3.33 feet and L over six is five feet. So we were closely approaching uh, E equals L over six, which would get us that zero PSF at that corner. So at that corner were 92 PSF. So we, we were approaching it, but that, that gives you kind of a, a gut check, if you will, um, when you're going through your calculations. You know, you, you know which zone um, you're in of the three we've described. And once you get your Q minimum, Q maximum, you can check back to say, does that make sense? Does it not? Um, so like I said, good gut check. So, And now let's plug in for a Q max, which is the same thing as follows, except with a plus sign rather than a minus sign which gets us the following. And all of that equals 458 PSF. And now we have an ultimate, or not, excuse me, not an ultimate, an allowable bearing pressure of 3,000 PSF. So that's less than 3,000. So if we do our factor of safety, equal our capacity over demand, which is just 3,000 over 458, which equals 6.5, and we usually do, like I said, um, factor of safety of 2.0 when we're checking this for service level loads. So greater than 2.0, so we are okay. So we've checked our three things, we're done. Global stability, there it is for shear walls. Um, and this actually, this can apply to you know, regular footings, it can apply to retaining walls, um, you know, really anything, global stability, structures in general. But for what I've shown here, this really kind of applies to foundations, footings type of thing. But I wanted to show you an example of a shear wall because we're going to be diving more into shear wall, shear wall design, concrete shear walls, wood shear walls, all that kind of fun stuff. So this is a warm up test. So I hope this helped. Um, and again, I want to point out these were all service level loads, so no factors applied. And we need to pay attention to that because it's kind of it's kind of dragged out. This starts to go pretty quickly when you do this, but you actually then go backwards and you start again with your chosen design method, whether it's LRFD or ASD, and then you apply factors to all that stuff, and then you get new forces and you start sizing. Like I said, if it's a wood shear wall, you're um, your sheathing thickness, your nailing specification, your hold down types, straps, all that kind of fun stuff. You know, the rebar size of your of your um, foundation, um, everything, everything that goes goes into it. So um, pay attention to that. That's important. All right, well done, everyone. Um, this was a fun one. Please, as always, like, subscribe, hit that bell thing get notified. Um, we're getting closer and closer to school starting up again. And with this whole, I don't know where I'm from. And I know this is kind of a global thing. The whole COVID thing is going to cause some strange times for going back to school. So it, I hope this can be a resource for you. You know, remember it, remember the team and lend a helping hand to anyone that you can that's struggling with their engineering uh, courses or practices or just learning in general. As always, see you guys in the next one. Bye.